Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a very interesting one entitled Making Friends for God, The Joy of Sharing in His Mission. This is lesson number nine in that series for August 29 of 2020, entitled Developing a Winning Attitude. So, what do you suppose that involves? Well, we'll find out, but after we say prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow before you now and we ask that we recognize and that you present yourself here, that we recognize your presence. As we study this lesson, we think about how you ministered, how you showed such incredible tenderness and kindness and love for even the worst of sinners. Help us to know how we can follow that example is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever looked at the life of Jesus and noticed who the people were that he encouraged versus the people he condemned? Who do you think it is that all the people who thought, who do you think it is, it is that all the people who thought they were righteous ended up getting his condemnation while many who are obviously sinners received his blessing? Why do you think that, that is? Hmm. Does it seem like he was mixed up? And what does it say to you that the judge of the entire universe was so incredibly forgiving? He is the same judge who will one day stand speaking on our behalf and answering the Satan's accusations against us. You need to read about that in Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. Do any of us have the attitude of the Pharisees? I'm asking you to look at yourself. I won't ask you to look at anybody else. Why would we think like that? Do we sometimes suggest that we have the truth? Does that make us better or does that just make us more in debt to those who do not have the truth? Can you think of any place in the Bible where Jesus exhibited pride or superiority? Was he bragging in John 8 where he essentially said three times, I am God? What do you... I, I, I try to imagine that, situ that scene. Here, here's the Sanhedrin. These are the people who believed they were in control of all religions. They were the, the super religious people for the whole world. And he's standing there and condemning them and say, by the way, I'm God. So he goes on for a little while. Oh, by the way, I'm God. And finally he says, before Abraham was, I am. And they said, oh yeah? <laughs> Grab a stone. Let's see if we can stone this guy. Wow. Well, that, that really set him off, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Here he called, referred to himself as being God, and uh, he just, uh, somebody just says it's like uh, apoplectic. Yes. <laughs> he apoplectic. It, he did it simply. He didn't fool around. Yeah. It, it, right to the point. Yeah. You were of your father the devil. That was fairly direct. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, Think of the responses of people who received his forgiveness. The former demon-possessed prostitute, Mary, ended up being one of his most faithful followers. The murderer, Saul, ended up being Paul, his most ambitious and successful evangelist. The two former demoniacs from Gadara, Gentiles, the first Gentile missionaries, ended up bringing an entire region to hear Jesus, and the masses were fed by him. Wow. If God in him, human form did not exhibit pride or superiority, how would we dare to do so? Why do you think the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been so much more successful in reaching out to the poor and disadvantaged in our world than we have at re reaching the rich and the powerful? Should we be looking for more ways to reach out to the more prosperous members of society? Or should we just continue to focus on the poor? Why are the poor uh, more willing to, to um, listen to the gospel message? Why is, it, why is our church growing so much faster in Africa and some parts of Asia and South America than it is in North America or Europe where Protestantism started? So how can we develop the kind of attitude that Jesus had 
Well, there's a story I'm assuming that you're fairly familiar with. I'm going to read a few verses, John 4. At, the mo at that moment, Jesus' disciples returned, and this is, of course, the story of Jesus meeting that woman at the well in Sychar. She was, she was living with the fifth husband. She wasn't, I'm not even sure if she was married to him, but the fifth man. And Jesus started to have that, that conversation with her, very gentle, and he, said, he finally ended up saying, I'm the Messiah. I wonder if he'd even told his disciples that yet. <laughs> Don't know. So, not, but at that moment, Jesus' disciples returned, and they were greatly surprised to find him talking to, with a woman. But none of them said to her, what do, you, what do you want? Or asked him, why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, went back to town, and said to the people there, come and see the man who told me everything I have ever done. Now, if those people in the village had some idea about her history, <laughs> they, <Yes>. Wow, <laughs> how does he know all of that? Anyway, that's the story. So, with his divine insight guided by his father, Jesus knew perfectly well the full story of the full history of that woman that he met at the well at Sychar. And yet, look at that discussion with her. He <laughs> revealed something to her that he probably had not yet even revealed to his disciples. And what was the result? Jesus spent two days in her village teaching and preaching and healing Samaritans. How do you think the disciples felt about ministering to the Samaritans? Not relaxed. Have any, any trouble with doing that? The animosity between Jews and Samaritans uh, is well known. It went back to 700 B.C. But Jesus paid no attention to those traditional animosities. As Seventh-day Adventists, we have often bragged that we are the fastest growing major church in the world. But Pentecostals, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Latter-day Saints, or otherwise known as Mormons, are also growing very quickly. Do we have anything that they do not? Is it clear in your mind what that might be? There's one thing that I think we sometimes forget, the old saying, pride goes before a fall. Mm-hmm. Christ never showed that. Yep. Uh, you asked a question. You expect an answer? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm waiting. Um, to me, to me, I believe beyond whatever else the Adventist Church has to offer, to me the most meaningful one is a true picture of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. If you understand that, he says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. See, uh, you don't really need any more. Yes. <laughs> and I, we need to come back to the basics always, all the time, all over the world. Um, and succinctly in his prayer, he says, eternal life is to know. Is it? Yeah, you know, know the Father in himself. Yes, yes. Nothing else, yeah. really, truly. Now, that means you've got, uh, we define what uh, no means. Yes. It incorporate everything we possibly can Absolutely. about about God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Well, it's well known that when traveling from Jerusalem to Galilee, Jews typically or customarily went down that steep hill all the way to Jericho, crossed the Jordan River, traveled up through the Gentile territory of Perea, and then had to cross the river again into Galilee just to avoid going through Samaria. So it's very interesting that in John 4.4 4 it says, he, that is Jesus, needed to go through Samaria. Is that talking about something? Uh, does that mean that God already knew exactly what was going to happen? He revealed it to Jesus and he said, yes, I'm on my way. I don't see how you could explain that any other way. He realized, God realized that there was a woman that would play a key role, that the people there were ready to listen, you know, and he had had, he had just spent, what, about a year working, primary, almost a year, working with the people in Judea, trying, quietly working under the hate radar because he knew that as soon as he spoke up very loud, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin would be after him. They already were. And so now he said, leave them, let me travel through Samaria, and here's a village that welcomed him. And he spent a couple days there and had a marvelous experience. Well, 
Is it possible that something like that could happen to us today? Yeah. When we look at people, is it possible that God to us could say that one or that one or that one? Those are people that you could speak to and, and, and have an influence on. I think on this side of eternity, we will never know, never know how many lives we touch. Many of these folk, yeah. especially in uh, difficult countries, yeah. uh, may not ever join the church, but I want to think that we will see them in the kingdom. Yeah. I think we as a church comparatively recently, <coughs> recently have broadened our, you might say, flashlight. Mm -hmm. We're getting to both sides. Mm -hmm. There was a time we got there here and there, but we are making, and I'm talking here in the States, even California right now, they're doing medical stuff, they're doing Bible stuff for everybody that cares to come, and a lot do. Mm -hmm. I can remember when I was a child, that didn't happen too many often. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kerry, I think you have something there for us. I think so. Oh. When Jesus sat down. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was Jim. I'm sorry. Okay. When Jesus sat down to rest at Jacob's well, he had come from Judea, where his ministry had produced little fruit. He had been rejected by the priests and rabbis, and even the people who professed to be his disciples had failed of perceiving his divine character. He was faint and weary, yet he did not neglect the opportunity of speaking to one woman, though she was a stranger, an alien from Israel, and living in an oh, me, living in open sin. Ellen White Devires Bizarre of Ages 194. This woman represented the working of a practical faith in Christ. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. He who drinks of the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver becomes a giver. The grace of Christ in the soul is the spring in the desert, welling up to refresh all and making those who are ready to perish eager to drink of the water of life. Ellen White, The Desire of Ages, 195. Carrie, I think you have something more. Yes, and this is from Ellen White and Lift Him Up, page 183. Uh, uh, paragraph, no, 183 page in paragraph 3, sorry. Though he was a Jew, Jesus mingled freely with the Samaritans, setting at naught the Pharisee customs of his nation. In face of their prejudices, he accepted the hospitality of this despised people. He slept with them under their roofs, ate with them at their tables, partaking of the food prepared and served by their hands, taught in their streets and treated them with the utmost kindness and courtesy. And while he drew their hearts to him by the tie of human sympathy, his divine grace brought to them the salvation which the Jews rejected. Wow. The Savior was above all prejudice of nation or people. He was willing to extend the blessings and privileges of the Jews to all who would accept the light which he came to the world to bring. Can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. Boy, we're at a time now when there's so much talk about prejudice and there's so much yes. talk about racism and so forth. Boy, here's the answer. It caused him great joy to behold even one soul reaching out to him from the night of spiritual blindness. That which Jesus had withheld from the Jews and enjoined upon his disciples to keep secret was distinctly opened before the inquiring woman of Samaria. Mm. For he who knew all things perceived that she would make a right use of her knowledge and be the means of leading others to the true faith. That's from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 147, paragraph 1. I hope you out there are familiar with that little book, Spirit of Prophecy. Um, back in the 1870s, the Ellen White had sent out things, articles and so forth like this to different people, and people began to get the idea that she had some real insights into the great controversy. And they encouraged her, please write something about that. And she wrote these four small books, 
and it was primarily for Adventists. So it has some very, I mean, she didn't hesitate to see I Saw and Vision and that kind of stuff. These are wonderful books. It doesn't include everything that's in the larger uh, spirit of the larger uh, Great Controversy series uh, that we know about the five books, but these are very useful. And this is one, one of those, those books. But when talking with the woman of Samaria, Jesus could very easily have fallen into the trap of arguing about Jewish religious practices versus Samaritan religious practices. He did not. We should not allow ourselves, especially as we are first speaking of spiritual things to someone, to fall into the trap of arguing with people about their beliefs versus our beliefs. Our job is to present Jesus Christ to them. The disciples that Jesus saw in that woman, only a woman burdened with sin and a Samaritan from whom they needed to keep a safe distance. And I'm sure at the, at, when they first saw her talking to Jesus, they had no idea about her history. What do you think they had to say when they heard about her history? Later. It took a while to get it together. <laughs> Boy. But Jesus recognized, with the assistance of the Holy Spirit, a receptivity in her heart. I want to think that when these disciples came back and saw their master sitting with the, the isolated place with this woman and talking, um, I'm not sure, they probably were scratching their heads, says, did we do it right? But it was a good object lesson. <laughs> yeah. They, they learned that lesson way after perhaps the cross even. Exactly. So why do you think Jesus chose to lead the disciples through Samaria instead of taking them down across the Jordan and up through Perea as most of the Jews were accustomed to doing? Oh, wish. Did he know in advance that there was a woman that he would meet by the well at Sychar and what the result would be? Absolutely. Well, consider a later story. Charles? Acts 8, 4, to 4 and 5 and verse 14. The believers who were scattered went everywhere preaching the message. Philip went to the principal city in Samaria and preached the Messiah to the people there. The apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had received the word of God, so they sent Peter and John to them. I, uh, there are several times I find it very interesting, and, and this is still true of the church, they hear, oh, something marvelous is happening over there. Well, we better send some people to investigate. You know, what's going on? Look at the example later of an anti Antioch. You know, oh, quick, send Barnabas up there, find out what's going on. Oh, those people are preaching the gospel to the Gentiles? Ooh, I wonder if that's safe. <laughs> and then he calls Paul and, well, the rest is history. That, that might have been a pretty uh, rough general conference session then. You think so? <laughs> Sounds like. <laughs> Do you think Philip would have gone to Samaria if Jesus had not opened the door earlier? Hmm. Probably not. Good question. When you reach out to people, even some who appear to be very far from the kingdom of heaven, should we expect an immediate response? No. Often after sowing seed, it may be a long time before any harvest is reaped. Are people naturally attracted to you? Question. Are you, yes. Are we to even look for harvest on this side of eternity? Well, it's nice to look for harvest. <laughs> you might not find it. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, uh, in ratio, I want to think that more people knew about Christ when Paul was in business than now. And wow. we still feel, it, come to think, yeah. come to think. <laughs> even though, even then, I have the audacity to pray, even so come Lord Jesus, yeah, have I done how much I can, could. Uh, I, it, it needs to, it prompt us to ask ourselves every day, mm -hmm. What, how have we allowed the Lord to use us to enhance His kingdom? Yeah, yeah. Do we ever turn people away, even unintentionally by our attitudes? Man, I hope not. Uh, 
John 15, 15. Yeah. I do not call you servants any longer, because servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends, mm. because I have told you everything I have heard from my Father. Wow. Mm. <clears throat> try, just try to wrap your mind about that idea. God wants to call you a personal friend. That's what he's saying. If God is willing to accept us, sinful as we are, so far removed from the Garden of Eden, and still wants to call us his friends, how could we even, how could we ever feel like some other human being was too low for us to be his or her friend? That's why I think Christianity is a participatory religion, yeah. because we, Christ says, walk with me, talk with me, let's, let's solve today's problems. What, what's going on in your life? Other religions don't. It's a, it's a worship. It's take the food to the idol, take the beads, whatever it might be. It's, it's a singular action. Yeah. Uh, personal relationship uh, in, in terms of faith is peculiar only with Christians. Yeah, absolutely. nowhere else. Nowhere else. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I think we have to be respectful of other Christians. Yeah. There are good people out there that haven't got the full picture, but that doesn't mean to say we should be superior. You yeah. don't want to even keel until you get a bit further along. Let me ask you out there another question. Do you criticize your friends when they're w for their weaknesses and their mistakes? How long would you remain their friends if you did that? Or do we tend to accept our friends even when they make mistakes? And so look at these two stories from the life of Jesus. And we're going to focus quite a bit on these two stories, so pay careful attention if you will. I'm going to read the first one, Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. I hope you have your Bible there. I'll be reading from the Good News Bible. Jesus left that place and went off to the territory near the cities of Tyre and Sidon. Now Jesus had spent a long time in Judea. They were ready to kill him, so he left there. He transferred his ministry up to Galilee. He worked for about a year there, and they were looking for his life there, and finally he said, okay. He took his disciples with him, and he said, we're going to go off into pagan territory, so I have a chance to work with my disciples, teach them some things without the constant interference of these religious authorities. So that's what he's done. He's headed off for Tyre and Sidon. This is pagan territory. A Canaanite woman who lived in that region came to him. Son of David, she cried out, have mercy on me, sir. My daughter has a demon and is in, terrible, in a terrible condition. So how did this lady know that Jesus could help her? What did she know about him? And how did she find out anything about him? word got around wherever Christ went. It didn't take long. I think it was last week, or it might have been the week before that, we, we read some passages of Scripture that people from hundreds of miles away were coming to, to hear Jesus and to be healed by Him. So I'm sure that's how she found out. Jesus did not say a word to her. His disciples came to Him and begged Him, send her away, she's following us and making all this noise. Then Jesus replied, I have been sent only to the lost sheep of the people of Israel. At this, the woman came and fell at his feet. Help me, sir, she said. Jesus answered, it isn't right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. That's true, sir, she answered. But even the dogs eat the leftovers that fall from the master's table. And if you could read Greek, if we could read Greek, sir, you'll find it very interesting. He says, you don't throw the food to the outside dogs, the big ones, the ones that protect the property that might bite you or whatever like this. But you do share the food with the puppies and the little dogs inside the house and so forth. So it's a, a, very, a very nice picture there. So Jesus answered her, You are a woman of great faith. What you want will be done for you. And at that very moment, her daughter was healed. Wow. There was another occasion when it says, Greater faith I've never seen among. And this was not a Jew. It was... A Roman centurion. Roman centurion. So here's a Canaanite yeah, woman. Yeah. That was a Roman centurion. Yes. <clears throat> Amazing. The ancient Canaanites, let's learn a little bit more about them. The ancient Canaanites worshipped heathen deities such as Baal, El, Asherah, and Astarte. 
These were fertility cult deities. Worshipping them was supposed to give one better crops and cause one's animals to have more babies. There is some evidence to suggest that they even offered human sacrifices as a part of their religious services. And if you want to read an absolutely appalling story about their kind of worship, read 2 Kings 17. Now, it's actually talking about the people of Samaria and, and their fall, but they fell because they were, they were copying the, the habits and the practices of these pagan fertility cult gods, uh, uh, religions. 2 Kings 17, you want to read something very enlightening. But so did Israel. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's the description in the Bible is of Israel, right. but it's Israel having copied what these other nations are doing. Well, how do you suppose the disciples would have described that Canaanite woman before she met Jesus? Wouldn't she be, have been considered an outcast from God, untouchable and unwinnable? How do you suppose their attitude changed after that encounter with Jesus? Did their, did their attitude change? Big time. Did Jesus' response to that woman sound like discrimination? We hear a lot about discrimination these days. Yeah. But Jesus knew about her faith and was only testing her so that he could demonstrate what a wonderful faith it was. Yeah. I think he was speaking, I'm sorry, okay. I think he was speaking to the disciples as well, Absolutely. as much, if not more. Absolutely, because he was yes. expecting to send them out to the whole world. <laughs> right, right. And who's out there in that world? A bunch of Gentiles that you aren't supposed to touch. He was teaching them. Yeah. Jesus, yeah. Ag Jesus agreed with the people, it's going to be with people where he could, accepted them where they were, and affirmed them when he was able. He developed caring relationships with others, and it was in the context of these relationships that he planted the seeds of faith and shared divine truths. From the Bible Study Guide, page 121. If you would like to see some of the materials that we have included in this lesson, you can, uh, you can get this material by just <coughs> looking on our website. The, the address is right there, theox org. Well, think about another story. Okay, we looked at one. This is found in Mark 14, 6 to 9. Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? Now, this is a story of the woman who came and poured that alabaster box of very precious, very expensive ointment on the head and feet of Jesus and, 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 and tried to bless him. Jesus said, I'm sorry, uh, Carrie, you're going to read that for us. Okay. I'm reading from the Good News Bible, Mark 14, 6 to 9. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a fine and beautiful thing for me. You will always have poor people with you, and any time you want to, you can help them. Let me interrupt for a second. Why is he talking about the poor people? Remember? Who is criticizing Jesus? Judas. Judas. Oh, this money should have been, this stuff should have been sold and all that money be give, given to us so we could use it for the poor. Well, Judas wasn't using the money that was given to him. He was, he was like the treasurer for the disciples. And he was using, if you go back to Desire of Ages and read, you find out that he was appropriating a lot of that money for his own personal use. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body to prepare it ahead of time for burial. And she's the only one on that occasion who actually got a chance to anoint the body of Jesus before or after his death. Yeah. And she was the only female in that room. Well, probably not. Um, I, I don't have time to go out to the details, but it turns out Simon, who was holding this right. feast, he was celebrating the fact that Jesus had healed him of leprosy, was a Pharisee. And it turns out he was Lazarus's uncle, uh -huh. which means that Martha and Mary were his nieces. Right. And Ellen White says there that, well, we know what kind of person Martha was. It's yeah. very likely that she was responsible for this meal. Very likely. Mary was not invited, but she came anyway. And then Jesus, well, and Ellen White goes on to say that 
Mary had actually been, you know, she ended up as a demon-possessed prostitute. Ellen White tells us that she was led into that kind of life by Simon himself, who led her into sin. Hmm. So, uh, there's more to the story. I wish I had time to show you all the documentation. Go ahead, Gary. Now, I assure you that wherever the gospel is preached all over the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And in brackets it says, see Luke 8, verses 1 to 3. And I'm going to read that, because we'll look at it again a little bit later, but talking about Mary Magdalene, Sometime later, Jesus traveled through towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The twelve disciples went with him, and so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out, not to mention her other problems. Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court, and Susanna, and many, many, notice the word many, other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. Wow. Okay, so how many people were working with Jesus? Hmm. Countless. These are the same ladies who were at the cross. Yes. Yeah. Well, in these two stories, we have a few, just a few smattering bits of information about two very different women. In Matthew 15, the woman was a Canaanite. She was a descendant of those people of Canaan that were supposed to have been driven out or destroyed when the children of Israel entered in the days of Jericho and when was, uh, I'm sorry, days of Joshua. When was that? Do you remember a little bit of the history? When, when did they enter the land of Canaan? In terms of what year? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 1400 B.C. 1400 years later, here's a woman from that same group, still there. Did Jesus turn to her and say, you weren't even supposed to be born? <laughs> At first, Jesus treated the Canaanite woman in the very way that Jews normally would have treated her. Thus, he gave his disciples a chance to see the extreme contrast between their normal behavior and what God expected of them. It was an example of how they would be expected to relate to other foreigners after their experience at Pentecost. Well, seeing wow. all of these things, how could the disciples have problem with uh, Paul? But he was a Pharisee. But anyway, <laughs> he'd be the bad man. <laughs> yeah, he goes to the Gentiles and the disciples, ah, you're going to do this. No, no, no. <laughs> he had the Lord himself. Wasn't she a Syrophoenician, Canaanite, yeah. Greek Canaanite woman? Mm -hmm. I mean, That's right. Could not be <coughs> any farther than Judaism. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, the woman who anointed Jesus' feet at that feast one week before his crucifixion was Mary Magdalene. What do we know about her? Some background material? She was the sister of Lazarus. Okay. She, to me, she was madly in love with the person of Jesus Christ. Probably. You have something to read for us, Charles, there? Yes. Sir, when Mary anointed the Savior's feet, Judas manifested his covetous uh, disposition. I told you the about how he wished the money could have gone, been gone yes. to him. Yes. Jesus, in his mercy, had pardoned the sins of Mary, which had been many and grievous, and her heart was full of love for her Savior. She had often heard him speak of his approaching death, and she was grieved that he should meet so cruel a fate. At great personal sacrifice, she had purchased an alabaster box of precious ointment with which to anoint the body of Jesus at his death. <coughs> but she now heard many express an opinion that he would be ele elevated to kingly authority when he went to Jerusalem. And she was only too ready to believe that it would be so. She rejoiced that her Savior would no longer be disposed, despised and rejected and obliged to flee for his life. In love and gratitude, she wished to be the first to do him the honor and seeking to avoid observation, and uh, he, she anointed his head 
and feet with the precious ointment and then wiped his feet with her long flowing hair. Again, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 375. I would encourage you to get those little facsimile books and read them. They are fascinating. Mm -hmm. What can we learn about the attitude of Jesus towards sinners from these two stories? What I can tell you is this for sure. He didn't say to them what he said to the Sanhedrin, that is, you are of your father, the devil, John 8, 44. <laughs> But, and, you know, that's what the Jew would usually have said. I mean, they would have said, these two women, with all their sinful past, you're the devil. He had love for them. Yeah. All those people. Well, friendship alone does not win people to Christ. It is certainly the right starting place. But, for our, for our, but our just having friends who are in the world does not attract them to Jesus unless we find ways to speak on his behalf. Should we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us in finding opportunities to introduce the subject of Jesus to people? Are we prepared to tell the good news to anyone who asks us? Do you remember what 1 Peter 3.15 says, be prepared always to, to, to give an answer to anyone who asks you? Well, in the past, some Seventh-day Adventists have felt so superior because of having the truth and keeping the Sabbath that when they have opportunities to speak to those who are not Adventists, they have launched into a di diatribe against those who are not meeting their standards. I hope none of you have ever observed that, either in yourselves or anybody else. Notice these descriptions of the way Jesus and later Paul, Silas, and Timothy took on such a task. Ephesians 4.15 Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ, who is the, in the excuse me, who is the head. Second Thessalonians 1, 1 to 4. From Paul, Cyrus, and Timothy to the people of the church in Thessalonica, who belong to our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God your Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Our brothers and sisters, we must thank God at all times for you. It is right for us to do so. Because your faith is growing so much, and the love each of you has for the other is becoming greater. That is why we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God. We boast about the way you continue to endure and believe through all the persecutions and sufferings that you are experiencing. Yeah, I, 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 I like to think about that situation. He spent, what, a few weeks in Thessalonica and raised up a church, and already, a very short time later, they're suffering terrible persecution. What kind of background, what kind of, I mean, how did he implant that kind of seed in their hearts that would say, I mean, I'm ready to die for this thing that I just barely heard about? That's amazing. <laughs> As they respond to truth. Maybe I mean, yeah. it just rang true with them. And I hope so. Yeah. What are, how else are we going to explain it? The Paul's own experience. Yeah. That's probably that was very strong in his mm -hmm. uh, success, his own story. Yeah. 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 He's the one who single-handedly wanted to wipe out this nonsense called Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, come on now, are we just supposed to ignore people's sins? Well, think about these words from Ellen White. If we would humble ourselves before God and be kind and courteous and tender-hearted and pitiful or tender, full of pity, there would be 100 conversions to the truth where now there is only one. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, 189, paragraph you know, 4. You know, if your mission was to g give a, a list of, of the sins or the misdeeds or whatever you want to call them about somebody else, you're not going to win a lot of people. No. But you got good news to tell about the Creator. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you're not going to, if you understand that, you don't have to have a litany of everybody else's. Yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll bring up your own. <laughs> what would happen to a Sabbath school class or a church group that made an intentional effort to exhibit, notice, notice these words, kindness, courtesy, tenderheartedness, 
and pity or mercy for all with whom they come in contact, into contact, with all whom they associate? Would people actually try to crowd into the Sabbath school class or church? You remember what it says in John 13, 34, and 35? And by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples because of what? Love. Because you love one another. Right. What does that say about everybody else? Nobody else loves one another? That's what it implies, isn't it? If, they, if, if Christians were literally known as the people who love, what would happen? Uh, how, how is that uh, exhibited? Loving for another. You, you really, what you have to do is get over your self-centeredness. Yeah. And then, and if you're doing things that are always loving, mm -hmm. you're not sinning. Yeah. So what's the basic principle upon which we're to accept sinners? Jim? Romans 15, 7. Accept one another then for the glory of God as Christ has accepted you. Then Ephesians 4, 32. Instead, be kind and tender-hearted to one another and forgive one another as God has forgiven you through Christ. Good news, yeah. Bible. And again, that's the point. If the gracious and wonderful way God has treated us, if we really want to be more and more like Him, how should we treat other people? I mean... Are, are we on a special level? And we don't have to, you know, the, as the Greeks would say, the hoi polloi, we don't have to worry about those people. It's, we're up here and we're, we're God's special people. I mean, that's so, so silly when you really think about what, what happened. If God has forgiven us despite our foibles and mistakes, how can we criticize other sinners? Recognizing the graciousness with which Christ has accepted us should make us eager to extend that kind of acceptance and grace to others. As faithful Seventh-day Adventists, we may feel that we are not hiding any secret sins. However, what sins are most offensive to God? We don't have any secret sins, right? Mm -hmm. Carrie? God does not regard all sins as of equal magnitude. There are degrees of guilt in His estimation as well as in that of man. But however trifling this or that wrong act may seem in the eyes of men, no sin is small in the sight of God. Man's judgment is partial, imperfect, but God estimates all things as they really are. The drunkard is despised and is told that his sin will exclude him from heaven, while pride, selfishness and covetousness too often go unrebuked. But these are sins that are especially offensive to God, for they are contrary to the benevolence of His character. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. Why do you suppose pride, selfishness, and covetousness don't too often go unrebuked? It's like if I'm pointing a finger at you for being proud, selfish, and I've got three other fingers pointing back at me. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, it's so common, yeah. Okay. To that unselfish love, which is the very atmosphere of the unfallen universe. That's the finish of that other sentence. Yeah. He who falls into some of the grosser sins may feel a sense of his shame and poverty and his need of grace of Christ. But pride feels no need, and so it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings he came to give. This is from Steps to Christ, page 30, paragraph 1. Yeah, I'm a Christian, and I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. So my wife shouldn't I be proud, right? Do any of us have any pride, selfishness, or covetousness? Well, look at Romans 5. I'm going to read just a few of these verses. But for when we were still helpless, Christ died for the wicked at the time that God chose. It is a difficult thing for someone to die for a righteous person. It may even be that someone might dare to die for a good person, but God has shown us how much He loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. Wow. Mm. Amazing. This should eliminate all objections that we might have in accepting others. Jesus' attitude was not, do whatever you please, it's all right, I still accept you. 
and that's the attitude of many Christians, his attitude was rather, no matter what you have done, I am willing to forgive you and provide you with power to change. Biblical truth presented humbly in Christ's spirit with a loving attitude wins hearts and changes lives. Now, let's talk about that. That's something that worries a lot of people. We cannot change our lives by ourselves. It is by beholding what is good and inspired that we allow the Holy Spirit to have access to our minds. He is the one who can change us. Charles? It is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has the power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. Great Controversy, page 555, first paragraph. Let's, let's take a moment and analyze what that says. If we are willing to take some time every day, as much time as possible, and open our minds, and, and by, well, how do we do that? We look to Jesus, we think about him, we, we read the Bible, we pray to him, we, we, we think about ways in which we, could be, we can become more like God and so forth. What we're doing, what are we doing? Maybe I should ask the question. We're really opening our minds to allow the Holy Spirit to make the changes there that need to happen. If we're constantly exposed to that kind of stuff, our lives will change. Now, what do you suppose happens on the other side if our, our, our minds are uh, full of uh, the latest TV programs, the latest uh, internet uh, goings on, that's uh, full of uh, you know, social media and so forth? What are we seeing on those like, locations? Are we seeing Jesus? No. No. Before you move on, Ellen White made a beautiful statement. Do you know that one? Mm -hmm. She said, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in yeah. contemplating the life of Jesus yep. Christ. Absolutely. That's, uh, st that's uh, Desire of Ages, I think it's 58, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere about there. I didn't memorize that part. <laughs> mm -hmm. If our goal, think about this, if our goal is to become more and more like Jesus, and if we know that he has accepted us, we should be more than willing to accept others despite their sins. Mm -hmm. This is not an invitation to encourage them to remain in their sins. However, by accepting the Holy Spirit, they can be transformed by beholding Him on a daily basis if they are willing. So how do we reach the place where it's, it's more exciting for us to, to, to study our Bible, to think about God, to, to learn about Him, and be changed, more exciting than the typical entertainment of our time. The devil is the world's greatest entertainer. Yeah. So what groups of people rebuked and criticized Jesus? What groups of people accepted him openly? Why was Jesus scorned by the so-called right, righteous Pharisees and Sadducees, but at the same time was called a friend of sinners? His grace saves us so that we can know his truth and live his life. Truth without love leads to stifling legalism, which strangles spiritual life. So-called love without truth leads to tolerance, sentimentalism with no substance, leaving an individual adrift on a sea of uncertainty. Truth presents in love leads to an authentic Christian experience that provides clear direction, purpose, and certainty. That's yeah. from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Very good. Uh, 1 Peter three fifteen and 16. 
but have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor him as Lord. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have in him, but do it with gentleness and respect. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are insulted, those who speak evil of your good conduct as followers of Christ will be ashamed of what they have said. Think about that for a moment. Be ready at all times to answer anyone asks you to explain the hope you have in you, but do with gentleness and respect. I uh, had the wonderful experience many years ago of going, I was attending uh, John Hopkins University getting a master's in public health. And there was a woman there who was interested in studying the Bible and learning more. So I said to her, okay, once a week we had, it up, we had a one hour lunch period where we had, uh, which were free to do what we wanted to do. Groups could get together and do various things. So, okay, during this time, we'll come together. And I said, you ask any question you want, we'll bring our Bibles and let's see if we can find an answer. So try that a few times and see what happens to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very happy to tell you that, that that young woman who had never heard of a Seventh-day Adventist at the beginning of that year ended up being a professor in one of our Adventist universities. Mm. As a result of, partially as a result of that experience. Well, so are we supposed to be encyclopedias of biblical knowledge? so that we know immediately how to answer any question that is brought to us? That, of course, would be wonderful. It would be nice if it were true. But it is impossible, really. However, a person who asks a question, a serious question, needs to be given a serious answer. If we do not know the answer, we need to know where we can find the answer. And that is not so hard to do. There are so many resources that you can, you can turn to to, to try to find the answers to serious questions. So we should not hesitate. If, if you don't know, I'll, I'll find out. The next time we get together, hopefully I'll be, I'll be able to give you an answer. And uh, this little device. Yes. <laughs> yes, your little handheld computer. Yep. Your cell phone. Real handy concordance in this. It really, yeah. truly, yes. It's really amazing. It's amazing what yeah. is there. Do we really know what we believe? Do we know why we believe it? Are we able to explain that to others? And what does it mean to explain what we believe with meekness and fear? I, uh, I was trained as a pastor way back when. But I love to go through series of Bible studies that people have prepared and see how they approach these whole kind of things. Right now, I'm watching a, a something on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, well, it's on the internet, under Adventist World Radio. Their series on, on Bible prophecies explained. Yeah. Marvelous series. Really good. Well, okay. have you ever been asked? For designs on Bible prophecies explained marvelous series. Really good. Check it out. Excuse me? You see, there's, the, there's what happens if you ask a question and your phone is sitting there. He's going he's to answer Answers you. Answer it for you. Answer right there. <laughs> Love it. So, uh, in Christ is the tenderness of the shepherd, the affection of the parent, and the matchless grace of the compassionate Savior. His blessings he presents in the most alluring terms. terms. He is not content merely to announce these blessings, he presents them in the most attractive way to ex excite a desire to possess them. So his servants are to present the riches of the glory of the unspeakable gift. The wonderful love of Christ will melt and subdue hearts. When the mere re reiteration of doctrines would accomplish nothing. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. O Zion, that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountains. O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. Behold your God. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom. Isaiah 41 and verses 9 to 11. That's Desire of Ages 8.26. There are some people who seem to specialize in pointing out the sins of others. Why do they do that? The very act 
looking for evil in others develops evil in those who look. By dwelling upon the faults of others, we are changed into the same image. By beholding, we become changed. There we have it. In that case, we're... But by beholding Jesus, talking of his love and perfection of character, we become changed, changed into his image. By contemplating the lofty ideals he has set before us, we shall be uplifted into a pure and holy atmosphere, even the presence of God. When we abide here, there goes forth from us a light that irradiates all who are connected with us. Ellen White, Ministry of Healing, 492. It has been suggested uh, that we need to approach people with the understanding that there is a hidden hunger in their hearts to know God. It may seem like the world around us is completely uninterested in spiritual matters, but that is not true. Stop and think for a moment how Jesus approached a Samaritan woman, a Jewish scribe, a Roman soldier, a Canaanite seeker with a demon-possessed daughter, and that woman whose reputation was severely soiled. From these stories, have you learned anything about the attitude of Jesus? There are many stories that could be told about people who were probably led by the Holy Spirit even though they did not know it and came into contact with a Seventh-day Adventist church or member and became faithful church members. As a Sabbath school class or church, are we holding open our doors to make such encounters more likely? Friendship and love open the doors of hearts, but it does not lead people to Christ without some kind of intentional witness. So, how would you and your church respond to the following scenes? And we're running out of time, so we're probably only going to have a chance to look at one of these. Carrie? Okay. A homeless man camps out in your church parking lot. He's been there for three nights. What are appropriate ways to relate to him and some not so appropriate ways? How can you be redemptive without turning the parking lot into a tent city for the homeless and negatively impacting the neighbors? Wow. Yeah, and there's other situations you can look at your, your study guide. Uh, when people die, how do we comfort them without getting carried too much carried away with our doctrines about which is so different about the state of the dead and other situations like that that you could think of but how can we be more like Jesus is the real question let's pray our kind and wonderful father what a lesson this has been about your attitude toward sinners and unfortunately the attitude you had to take toward those who claim to be so righteous May we come to have that attitude to our sinners that you had. May we reach out with the friendship that we, the best friendship we can muster and, and help them to see your love through everything we do for them and with them is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.